A memory of light begins with Talmanes. Talmanes and the Band of the Red Hand are in Camelin trying to save the city from a Shadowspawn army and are also trying to recover the dragons. The Shadowspawn arrive through a waygate located in Camelin and now they have the city under siege. While defending the gates of Camelin, Talmanes kills a Merdral, but the Merdral manages to strike him with its sword. Talmanes knows that without healing, the taint from the Merdral's sword will kill him, but his goal is to recover the dragons, so he pushes on. When he reaches the storage room where the dragons are being kept, they find the place burned down. Thankfully, he later comes across Aludra, who has the dragons with her. Having achieved the objective, Talmanes and the survivors began planning their escape. They know that Camelin is lost and they're completely surrounded, so they're unable to go anywhere. Talmanes begins to pass out from the murderer wound, but before he does, he gets the idea to use the dragons to blow up the city wall and make an opening. Aludra and the survivors do exactly that, and so they manage to escape. We then see Mogidian as she arrives at the final meeting between the remaining Forsaken. A strange and disfigured woman also arrives at the meeting and Mogidian realizes that she is Grendel, who has been punished for failing to kill Perrin in the past book. Morden introduces her as Hesalam, which means without forgiveness in the old tongue. He also introduces a new member to the group, Masram Taim, who goes by the name of Mahel. Morden tells the remaining Forsaken to wrap up all the remaining plots and schemes, for the end has arrived. In the Black Tower, Andrew, his group and Pevara are still planning their escape. Pevara has told them that she suspects that Masran Taim is a dark friend and is turning people to the shadow by force. She explains that this can be done in a process that involves 13 Merdral and 13 Channelers. Pevara tries to teach Andrew how to form a circle between them, but this doesn't go well. Andrew takes full control of Pevara, and in a moment of panic, Pevara bonds Andrew to try to gain some control over him, but then Andrew does the same to her. The two end up bonding each other, something that we hadn't seen before. They now have some access to each other's thoughts and memories. We then learn that one of Loghain's companions has been cut and turned to the shadow. They conclude that Loghain must have also been captured and is probably being turned to the shadow as well. Androl and his group capture one of Taim's Ashaman and they question him. The Ashaman reveals where Loghain is being kept and so Androl and his group go rescue him. They kill the guards watching over him and when they find him, they're relieved to see that he has not yet turned to the shadow, but he is too weak to channel. The Mahel's Ashaman quickly arrive to stop them and a battle ensues. Andrew tries very hard to make a gateway, but suddenly the roof collapses. Andrew and his group are dug out and taken prisoners. They are to be turned to the shadow one by one. At the field of Merilor, the forces of the light gather to meet with the Dragon Reborn. Suddenly, Talmanes, the band, Aludra, and some refugees arrive through a gateway and they inform Elaine and Ewain that Camelin has fallen and the Shadowspawn have taken the city. Talmanes is now unconscious and is very close to dying, but Nynaeve quickly arrives and begins to heal him. Igyanin and Beldaman also arrive and they tell Ewain that they are here to serve the Amerlin seed. Igyanin feels very guilty for giving away the Mel Adam to the Sunchan when she promised Nynaeve that she was going to destroy it back in Book 4. So in order to restore her honor, she has decided to serve Ewain. The following day, Randall Thor orders the meeting to begin. All of the major rulers from the Westlands are in attendance and so Rand declares his demands. He says that since he's given away his life to fight the Dark One, he needs three things in exchange for his life. One is what he calls the Dragon's Peace. It requires all nations to agree not to expand their borders, forbids them from attacking each other, and requires them to open a school in each capital. Two, letting Rand break the seals to the Dark One's prison, and three, that Rand has complete control over the armies of the Light during the last battle. 
A long argument ensues, and Egwene is adamant that she is not letting Rand break the seals to the Dark One's prison. Finally, Rand tells Egwene that no matter what, he won't change his mind on the matter, and if they fail to sign the Dragon's Peace, it will mean the death of them all, for he will only face the Dark One on his own terms. Still, Egwene refuses to bend to Rand's will, but then Moraine enters the room. Rand cannot believe that Moraine is alive, and everyone is very happy to see her. Moraine reminds everyone of the prophecies of the dragon, and tells them that they must agree to the dragon's peace. If they do so, the next age will begin with peace. The rulers tell Rand that the Sun Chan must also sign the document, and Rand promises to make peace with them. And if Tuon doesn't sign, then the document is voided. Avienda then comes forward and asks Rand to include the Aeo in the Dragon's Peace. Perrin tells Rand that the Aeo could be used to ensure that the Dragon's Peace is followed, and Rand agrees. All of the Aeo except for the Shido are to be written into the document as enforcers of the peace and mediators of disputes between nations. With this, the Aeo will have a purpose after the last battle, and maybe the horrible future that Avienda saw at Rurion will not come to pass. Moraine then tells Rand that since he will be busy fighting the Dark One at Chael Ghul, he probably shouldn't have complete control over the armies of the Light, and Rand agrees, so he decides to give Elaine this responsibility. Finally, Moraine tells Ewaine that Rand is not going to break the seals to the Dark One's prison, but she, Ewaine, will. She tells Ewaine that the prophecy is demanded, and Ewaine agrees, but only when she feels it must be done. At the end, everyone begins to sign the Dragon's Peace, and Randall Thor leaves to help a friend. Landman Dragoran and his army are fighting a desperate battle at Tarwen's Gap. The Shadowspawn army is very close to overwhelming them, but Lan and his army refuse to go down. Just when it seems that all hope is lost, gateways begin to appear and the rest of the Borderlander armies come to their rescue. Lan is overwhelmed with joy, knowing that Malkir will fight another day. Elaine Trakand, now having complete control over the armies of the Light, goes straight to work and with the help of the four great captains, they begin planning the war against the Shadow. The four major battlefields are at Camelin, Kandor, Tarwin's Gap, and Shia Ghul, so each great captain goes to one battlefront. Elaine and Lord Bashir will go to Camelin, Gareth Brynn and the Aes Sedai to Kandor, Lord Agomar to help the Malkiri and the Borderlanders at Tarwin's Gap, and Rodoli Turalda and the Aeo to Shia Ghul where Rand will face the Dark One. Loyo and the Ogier also arrive at the field of Merilor, ready to fight with the humans. They were very close to leaving this world, but they have decided to stay and fight instead. Elaine gives Fael the responsibility of coordinating the food supply, and also the very important task of guarding the Horn of Valir, and making sure that it gets to Matt. Perrin still has a score to settle with Slayer. He knows that the reason as to why Slayer is so powerful in the dream world is because he is there in the flesh, so Perrin decides to also go to the dream world in the flesh to face him. Gol asks to go with him and Perrin agrees. They go to see Rand and Perrin asks him about entering the dream world in the flesh. Rand tells him that it is a very dangerous thing but Perrin knows that it is the only way to defeat Slayer, so he asks Rand to show him how to get there in the flesh. Rand opens a gateway that leads to the dream world, and the two embrace each other and they say their goodbyes, and so Perrin and Gol leave to hunt Slayer. Once in the dream world, Perrin decides to go to the Black Tower first, because he thinks that the thing preventing anyone from creating gateways to the Black Tower is a dream spike. When they shift to the Black Tower, they do indeed find a purple dome surrounding it. Suddenly, a woman appears, and Perrin recognizes her as Lanfear. Lanfear offers to help Perrin, saying that she wants revenge against the person who imprisoned her. At the Black Tower, Androl and Pevara are yet to return to the Shadow, but they know that it is coming. 
Logan has survived 12 turning sessions, but he's beginning to break. Grendel, now known as Hesalam, arrives with several Black Aja sisters to help Mahel with the turning process. Andrew manages to break free from the shield and he frees Pevara and his men. The rest of Loghain's forces arrive to free Loghain and together they attack the Mahel's forces. Back in the dream world, Lanfear helps Perrin with the guards watching over the dream spike. She poisons their wine with forkroot and soon they collapse. Perrin takes the dream spike and Lanfear shows him how it works and how to deactivate it. He then asks Lanfear why she's helping him and she says that she's no longer one of the Forsaken and that she needs him to win, then she disappears. In the Black Tower, Andrew and Loghain's forces struggle against Mahel and his dark friends. Suddenly, Andrew realizes that he's now able to make gateways, so he creates a giant gateway the size of a wagon and places it in front of the dark friends just as they channel. He then opens it right behind them and they end up destroying themselves with their own channeling. Mahel and Hesalam escape the Black Tower, but the rest of the Dark Friends are killed when Andrew opens a gateway as wide as the floor and drops them hundreds of feet. With the Black Tower now liberated, they decide to put Loghain in charge and so the Black Tower prepares to join the last battle. At Tyrant's Gap, Landman Dragoran and his forces are still fighting an uphill battle against the Shadowspawn army. Lord Agomar tells Lan that they need to retreat, but Lan doesn't want to abandon Malkir for a second time. It's not until Narishma tells Lan that there's about a dozen of the Shadow's Dreadlords ready to attack that Lan finally realizes that Tywin's Gap is lost, and so he decides to retreat. Randall Thor arrives to help Lan. Moraine is with him and she is frustrated with Rand because he is supposed to go to Shyogul to face the Dark One but Rand doesn't feel like it's the right time yet. Rand gives Lan two crowns that have been forged to resemble the lost Malkiri crowns. One is for Lan and the other for Nynaeve. He then goes to face the Dreadlords and he realizes that Matram Taim is leading them. Rand gets carried away and tries to defeat Taim once and for all, but he quickly realizes that it is a huge mistake. If he goes after Taim and his dreadlords, he would spend too much energy fighting them and he will be too weak to face the Dark One. So he retreats and after speaking with Moraine, Rand concludes that the Shadow must have teams of dreadlords waiting to travel to wherever he is spotted to attack him so he cannot fight this war personally. In order to not draw attention, Rand begins using the Mask of Mirrors and wears other Ashaman's faces into battle. He goes to every major battlefront to help his allies, only revealing himself until the very end. Moraine thinks that Rand is putting himself in danger by doing this, but Rand cannot stand still while his people lose their lives for him. He tells Moraine that he intends to slay the Dark One but Moraine tells him that that's not possible because the Dark One is part of the pattern. Rand disagrees and tells her that the Dark One only exists outside of the pattern and therefore can be killed. Either way, Rand decides to go to Evudar first in order to negotiate with Tuan and secure her allegiance and also her signature for the Dragon's Peace. After saving Moraine from the Tower of Genjai, Matram Cotton goes to Evudar to rekindle his relationship with Tuan. He learns that she is now the Empress of Sonchan and her name is now Fortuna. As he arrives to see her, he notices that a Grey Man is about to attack her, but Matt manages to save her. The Grey Man gets away, but Fortuna is very impressed with Matt, and the two spend the night together. The next day, Fortuna is told that an assassin has been captured and when this assassin is brought to her, he turns out to be Randall Thor. Rand begins to negotiate with Fortuna. He tells her that he, Louis Theron Telemann, ruled these lands long before Arthur Hawkwing and therefore his authority supersedes hers. Fortuna realizes that this is true. Rand offers her peace and asks her to join him at the last battle. 
and he agrees to give her the land she already has, plus Terabon and half of Almoth Plain. She will get to keep all of the Domani that she already has, but she's not allowed to take any new Domani outside of her land. Matt tells Fortuna that he grew up with Rand and that she can trust his word. And so Fortuna agrees and signs the dragon's peace. Rand leaves and Matt and Fortuna prepare their armies for the last battle. At the Kandori battlefront, Ewain and her force have been very successful in stopping the Shadowspawn advancements and things seem to be going better than expected. Randall Thor arrives to say goodbye to Ewain and says that he's finally going to Shyogul. Rand tells Gawain that he and Galad are half of brothers and before he leaves he asks Ewain to show him the seals to the Dark One's prison but they realize that the seals that they have are fakes and the real ones have been stolen. They have no other choice but to move on. Rand leaves for Shyogul and Ewain returns to the battlefield where things seem to be normal at first but then out of nowhere a giant gateway opens up and an enormous Sharan army appears. The Sharans attack them and they take Ewain and her forces by surprise and in a matter of hours Ewain loses one in every two soldiers and about 120 Aes Sedai. Gareth Bryn and the remaining forces manage to escape but Ewain and Gawain end up behind enemy lines. The two of them hide from the Sharans and Ewain takes the opportunity to study these strange people. Until now, the nation of Shara had been very isolated and they refused any contact with the Westlands. It was said that the nation was in complete chaos until very recently but now they appear to be fighting for the shadow. Their leader appears and he finds and captures Lian who was also hiding. He releases her with a message to the Dragon Reborn that he, Bao the Wild, has come to slay him. He says that his old name was Barret Bell and Ewen recognizes it. Bao the Wild is the Mandred. All this time, the Mandred was in Shara fulfilling the prophecies of the Wild and is now leading the Sharan armies against the light. Ewain gets caught by a Sharan but she is rescued by Igyanin who appears out of nowhere and incapacitates the Sharan. Gawain then arrives with Bel Daman and together they escape. They reunite with Swan Sanche and the rest of their forces and Min also arrives and tells them that Rand has made a deal with the Sanchan and that they are coming to help them. Back in Ebudar, Matt and Fortuna learn that Ewain's forces have suffered a major defeat and are on the retreat. Fortuna briefly considers breaking her oath and making all the remaining Aes Sedai the money but Matt convinces her not to and tells her that they must fulfill their oath and go support them and so the Sanchan Empire travels to Kandor to help Ewain. When they arrive at Kandor, Fortuna goes to speak to Ewain and the two of them let each other know how much they despise each other. After a long argument, they agree to work together against the Shadow. Mint Farsha has been helping out at the Kandori front. When she sees Fortuna, she tells Matt that someone will try to assassinate her. Fortuna overhears this and asks how she knows this. Matt explains that Min has a unique ability that shows her viewings of people. Fortuna is delighted by this and she calls Min a truth speaker and declares that she is her doomseer. Afterwards, Matt and Fortuna go out to examine the battlefield and Matt immediately realizes that Gareth Bryn is leading them to disaster. Matt quickly goes into action and takes some of his Sunshine Force to fix Bryn's mistakes. Matt ends up saving Egwene's forces and he declares Gareth Bryn a dark friend because he's obviously trying to lose the battle. He asks Tuon to give him complete control over her armies and she agrees. He then sends Min to tell Ewain about Bryn being a dark friend. When Min tells Ewain the news about Gareth Bryn, she quickly dismisses it as nonsense but after she gives it some thought, she realizes that Bryn has been making a lot of mistakes so she goes to confront him. 
after he went points out the many mistakes that he has made, Gareth Brin accepts all responsibility. He says that there's something wrong with him and that his instincts are all wrong. Ewen realizes that Gareth Brin is under compulsion, so he is relieved of duty. Ewen and the Aes Sedai decide to give complete control of the armies to Matrim Cawthon. At Camelin, Elaine and her force decide to lure the Shadowspawn army out by setting the city on fire. After this, Elaine and her army retreat into the forest and the Shadowspawn give chase. In the forest, a recovered Talmanis and the Band of the Red Hand await with the dragons and Tam Al Thor and his Two Rivers men await with their longbows. With this strategy, they manage to defeat a large force of the Shadowspawn but after a while, this strategy stops working and Elaine is forced to retreat to Kyrian. As they retreat, they learn that there's a new Shadowspawn army heading for Kyrian and they realize that they are now at risk of getting surrounded. Bashir decides to attack this new Shadowspawn army first because he says that they will be tired and so they do so. After a brutal fight, Bashir's plan seems to be working but soon they learn that no one was watching their flank and now the other Shadowspawn army is very close to attacking them. Tam tells Elaine that Bashir has been lying about the scout reports and he has not sent anyone to watch their flank. Thanks to Bashir, they are now very close to losing. So Elaine relieves Bashir of duty and tells Talmanis to watch him because she thinks that he was leading them to defeat on purpose. At Tarwin's Gap, Landman Dragoran has also begun to think that Lord Agilmar is leading them to defeat on purpose because he continues to make very obvious mistakes. Land goes to confront Agumar, but he seems oblivious to his mistakes. When a messenger arrives to tell them that a Shadowspawn force has snuck behind them, Land decides that enough is enough and relieves Agumar of duty. Agumar is enraged at first, but after Land points out his numerous mistakes, Agumar realizes that there's something wrong with him. He says that he keeps having the wrong thoughts and that someone is messing with his head. Land recognizes this as compulsion. Back in Kyrian, Elaine tries to get her army out of the trap that Bashir led them to, but she cannot. They suffer many casualties, but then Loghain and his Ashaman arrive to help. Together with the Aes Sedai, they form a circle and together they manage to push the Shadowspawn armies back. Rotori Turalda, the Aeil and Avienda begin to plan their invasion of Sharugul. They don't know how long it will take Rand to confront the Dark One, but they're prepared to fight for as long as it takes. Rand has decided to face the Dark One with Moraine and Nynaeve because he needs them in order to properly use Kalendor. He knows that Kalendor has one major flaw, so as long as he's channeling into it, anyone can seize control over him, but he's prepared to take the risk. When the day finally arrives, Rand, Moraine and Nynaeve walk into Shaogul while Ituralda and the Aeil take control of the area. Tom Marilyn stays on top of the entrance to make sure that no one goes in. Rand takes Kalendor and he forms a circle with Moraine and Nynaeve as he begins to question whether it's the right time to confront the Dark One, a mysterious voice speaks to him and tells him, it is time, let the task be undertaken. And with this, he begins to walk towards the Pit of Doom. Further inside, Rand finds Morden. Rand offers his old friend the opportunity to return to the light, but Morden refuses and begins to attack him. As the two struggle, Rand touches the Dark One's essence and Rand and Moradin both become frozen in place. Rand is transported to a place outside of time. There's a vast nothingness around him, but he does see the pattern itself. The Dark One confronts him and thus their battle commences. In the world of dreams, Perrin and Gull continue to look for Slayer. The wolves tell Perrin that someone they call Heartseeker has been spotted in the dream. They track down Heartseeker, who turns out to be Grendel. Perrin and Grendel fight for some time, but she retreats into the waking world. The wolves then tell Perrin that Slayer is at Shaogul, and when Perrin and Gol arrive to fight him, Perrin notices that Rand has entered the Pit of Doom. 
Slayer is accompanied by some red veiled Aeo that can channel, but still Perrin and Gol manage to defeat them. Slayer retreats into the waking world and then Lanfear appears and she continues to help them. She heals Gol and tells them that the red veiled Aeo have been turned to the shadow. Afterwards, Elias Machera appears in the dream and he tells Perrin that he saw Grando coming out of Rodo Itoralda's tent. Perrin realizes what Grando is up to. She's corrupting the minds of the great captains with compulsion, so he tells Elias to go warn Itoralda before it's too late. Back in the waking world, Rodo Itoralda is leading the fight at Charagul. He keeps having very disturbing dreams and he keeps hearing voices that tell him to change his strategies. So far he has managed to block these voices, but now he cannot resist and he's about to give a very fatal order. When out of nowhere, wolves begin to pour in and Elias Machera leaps on top of him and knocks him out. Itoralda is very thankful for this because he knew there was something wrong with him and he was about to make a big mistake. In Candor, Iwain tells Matt that all four great captains were under compulsion and have been relieved of duty and that at Tarwin's Gap, the Borderlanders have lost two-thirds of their forces and that in Kyrian, Elaine has also lost much of her force. Matt realizes that they can no longer fight at four different fronts, so he orders all the armies of the Light to unite and fight at one front. He chooses the field of Merilor as the site of their final stand. In the dream world, Perrin tracks down Slayer and the two fight once again. Perrin is now very tired because he's been in the dream for way too long. Slayer gets the better of him and strikes him with an arrow. Perrin gets away but he begins to lose consciousness. Perrin knows that he's very close to dying so with all his remaining strength, he forces his body to wake up. He appears back in the waking world at the field of Merilor. Master Luhan finds him and takes him to get healed. In Tarvalin, Faio, her guards and Olver go to retrieve the Horn of Valir. They come under attack by a bubble of evil and they try to escape through a gateway, but the gateway malfunctions and they're transported to the Blight. Faio and her group decide to go to Shaogul because she knows that the Turalda and the Aeo are fighting there. At the field of Merilor, Matcham Cotton sets up his armies for the true last battle. He sends Ashaman to recruit more soldiers, including people from the village of Hinderstap. When he asks Iwain about the Horn of Valir, she tells him that Faio was put in charge of it, but she has not been seen anywhere. Matt tells Iwain to brace herself for the enemy has arrived and in an hour, the battlefield will be covered in blood, and so the last battle commences. As the last battle rages on, the Mandred begins to slightly outmaneuver Matram Cawthon when it comes to tactics, but Matt still has many plays left. The Mandred is linked to 72 channelers and is in possession of the second most powerful Saangriel ever made for a male, the Sokarnin. The Mandred goes around killing thousands and asking for Rand to come fight him. Iwain doesn't know what to do to stop him for he's just too powerful. Gawain decides to go after him and he puts on three of the blood knife rings and with their power he manages to reach the Mandred and the two fight. The Forsaken doesn't really take Gawain too seriously and after a short fight, the Mandred stabs him in the stomach and leaves him to bleed out. A mortally wounded Gawain manages to get on a horse and rides away. Back at camp, Matt sends Galad on a mission. He's to kill as many Sharan channelers as he can and he gives him one of the fox and medallion copies that Elaine made. As he travels north to go kill the Sharans, he comes across a dying Gawain. Gawain with his final words tells Galad that Rand is his half-brother. As Galad watches Gawain die, he decides to go avenge him. He manages to go behind enemy lines and finds the Mandred. The Forsaken fights Galad and Galad manages to do better than Gawain but still the Mandred is too much for him. The Forsaken severs his right arm and leaves him to die. Galad is later found by Anaisa Dai who takes him to get healed. 
When Wayne feels Gowan's death, she goes into a battle rage, killing a bunch of Sharons. Sylviana calms her down and takes her back to camp where she recovers from the pain. Back in the command tent, several Greymen try to assassinate Matt and Tuon, but they failed to do so. Unfortunately, Swan Sanchez is killed in the attack. Gareth Brynn, who was her warder, goes into a battle rage and is also killed. After Ewain recovers from Gawain's death, she goes back into the battlefield, stronger than ever. She notices that the shadow has been using too much bellfire and is causing the pattern to unravel. She then comes across Masrim Taim and the two fight. Taim unleashes a crazy amount of bellfire which causes the pattern to unravel even more. Ewain searches within her and creates a brand new weave that is the opposite of bellfire. She names it the Flame of Tarbalan. Ewain unleashes it on Taim and he dies, crystallized from the inside out. Ewain finds herself surrounded by the enemy, so she conjures a huge amount of the One Power and unleashes it as the Flame of Tarbalan once again. Ewain explodes with power and dies. She kills all the enemies around her and fixes the effects of Bellfire. On the Blight, Fa'io, her group and Alver try to reach Shayogul, but on the way there, they are chased by Trollocs. Fa'io gives Alver the Horn of Alir and tells him to take it to Matt, while she distracts the Trollocs. Alver takes Vela and they make a run for it. Vela runs like the wind, but she is killed by an arrow. Alver hides under some rocks while the Trollocs begin to surround him. Matt and his remaining armies are on the brink of collapse. The Mandred has proven too powerful. As Matt prepares his army for one last charge, he notices that Lan is riding towards the Mandred. When Tam and his two rivers men see what Lan is doing, they take their longbows and kill all the Trollocs in front of him, thus opening a path towards the Forsaken. Lan, wearing a Foxhead medallion copy, doesn't waste any time and immediately begins attacking the Forsaken. The Mandred is very impressed with his sword skills and wonders if Lan is actually Rand in disguise for he doesn't believe there could be anyone in this age that matches his skills. The Mandred tells Lan that he cannot win, but Lan is not here to win, he's here to kill him, and so he does. Lan puts his sword through the Mandra's throat, but in the process, the Forsaken puts his sword in Lan's stomach. When the Sharans see their leader dead, they lose all of their structure, so Matt takes the opportunity to order a full-on attack. Narishma manages to get to Lan and saves his life. In the Blight, Olver remains hidden under some rocks, but he sees that the Trollocs are trying to get to him. Olver is absolutely terrified. So out of desperation and thinking only of salvation, he blows the Horn of Valir. Suddenly, all of the Trollocs around him die and he's saved by a familiar face, Noah Cheren. Noah Cheren has returned as one of the heroes of the Horn. Since Matt died by Bellfire back in Book 5, his bond to the Horn broke. The heroes of the Horn all appear and they ride to join the battle. Brigitte Silverbow was killed while defending Elaine, but now that the horn was sounded, she returns to keep Elaine safe. After Perrin recovers from his injuries, he returns to the dream world and goes after Slayer. He finds him fighting Gull and some wolves. Slayer escapes to the waking world and Perrin, who now knows how to shift between worlds, follows him. Perrin overwhelms Slayer and follows him between worlds. After a long battle, Perrin with his hammer Mahalanir kills Slayer with a blow to the head. He also kills Lanfear after she finally betrays him and tries to use compulsion on him. When he learns that Fa'io became lost in the Blight, he goes to look for her and finds her alive under a wagon. The Sonchan capture Mugidian and they make her Damani. And at Shayogul, Avienda fights Grando, and during their struggle, Grando tries to use compulsion on Avienda, but it backfires, and now the Forsaken worships Avienda. At the field of Merilor, the armies of the Light and the Heroes of the Horn defeat the armies of the Shadow, but the war is not over for Matt. He feels that Pat and Fane is close and is going after Rand, 
so he goes after him. Padan Fain now calls himself Shaisam. He is glad that his two enemies, the Dark One and Randall Thor, are killing each other. When Matt arrives, Shaisam attacks him with Mashadar, and Matt pretends to be dead. But when Shaisam gets close to him, Matt takes back the ruby hilted dagger and stabs Shaisam with it, and thus the creature, once known as Padan Fain, dies. When Matt returns to camp, Fortuna tells him that she's pregnant. Outside of the pattern, Randall Thor confronts the Dark One. The Dark One refers to him as adversary and shows him futures in which he wins and there's no good in the world. And Rand shows the Dark One the opposite, futures in which the light wins and there is no evil. As Rand sees all of these futures, he notices that in some of the Dark One's futures, people are happy but they live without compassion for one another. In Rand's futures, people are also happy but they are also broken and seem hollow. He knows that they are missing something. Rand realizes that the Dark One is an essential part of the pattern, so he cannot kill him. The Dark One tries to break Rand by showing him the death of his friends and allies, but Rand stands strong and refuses to break. Now that Rand has learned that the Dark One is an essential part of the world, he realizes what needs to be done. He returns to the world and resumes his fight with Morden. Morden takes control of Kalandor, but this is exactly what Rand wanted. With Morden linked to Kalandor, he is at the mercy of Moraine and Lynaeve. Using Morden's power, they create a giant weave of Sidene, Sidar, and the true power, and with it, Rand puts the Dark One outside of the pattern and repairs the boar to its prison, thus taking away its ability to touch the world. With his mission now finished, Randall Thor is slowly dying from all of his wounds. He picks up Morin's body and takes him outside of the Pit of Doom. He sees an elderly Aeol woman that he doesn't recognize and she tells him that that is what needs to be done. Once outside, Rand slowly dies, while Morden actually recovers. After Rand finally dies, a funeral pyre is held for him, but Elaine, Min and Avienda don't really look too concerned. This is because they know the truth. Rand is now in Morden's body and is alive and well. As he looks at his funeral pyre, he notices that Katwin is looking right at him, but she doesn't say anything. Rand takes a horse and rides away free to do whatever he wants.